Hey, how's it going? Today I have something a little bit different. I wanted to do a quick video about some sort of digital fabrication, computer-aided design stuff. Please bear with me if it's not your thing. Maybe you'll find this useful. And you know, if it's not your thing, I totally get it because I always said when I started this business, like I had no interest in doing any of that computer design stuff or using CNCs or lasers. Uh, you know, I kind of told people, well, the reason I do this is because I don't want to sit in front of a computer all day. But I, I opened my mind to it and uh, I got hooked. And the reason is simple. Because of this equipment, I can compete with the stores, right? I can compete with factories and I can compete with uh, these big businesses. Whereas before, in order for me to bring my work to that level of detail and finesse, I needed to spend much, much more time by hand or there's only one of me, whereas the CNC can be cutting at the same time as me doing other things. Uh, it's a way that I can increase the quality of my work in a more time appropriate sense. And I can also create custom things for people, which is what we're gonna talk about today. So I have a client I'm working on a base 6.4 right now. His name is Danny, super cool dude. And he has all these really cool like fossil um, inlays and stuff that we wanted to do on the instrument. And so he was sending me the art for me to, you know, do some uh, CNC carving and do some inlays. And then there's one particular thing, I'm doing an inlay on the headstock of the sort of like horseshoe crab type of thing. Um, and so we're gonna jump to that in a minute, but first I wanted to show you something really quick that you should know in your CAD CAM stuff here, your little computer world, um, that might come in handy. So come on in. For simplicity's sake, here I'm going to pretend that we just needed to create some half circles for our inlay. And so we're gonna say that the client sent them to us. Now I'll show you that there's, depending upon what program you're using, there's a couple different ways you could do this, but there's basically two ways. One is you could create a circle, right? And then you could cut it in half and then you can get rid of the excess. There's one way you can create a half circle. Another way you might do it is draw a line, straight line for the bottom and then maybe draw an arch for the other half. Boom, there's our same shape again, right? And you know, the great thing about this type of work is that for every person out there that does it, there's a, there's a different way to do it. Here's the thing, the client might send you this and here's something you're gonna wanna look for when you get it. The second way I just did it, you can see that I click and highlight a piece of it and then this piece, they're actually not connected. They are two separate individual pieces. And here you can see I've zoomed in as far as I can. If I were to cut this out of my CNC, it would actually probably cut fine because these two ends are just right up against each other. But because they're two separate lines, it might confuse your machine, your laser, your CNC machine. They might make it run inefficiently or give you some little problems. So, you know, suppose I just got these from a client. Uh, you know, they sent me the art and I look at it and I can see this first one. Here I can see by just clicking on it, I can see, oh, it looks like it's pretty good, right? So there it is, everything's connected. And the other thing I can do is in my Aspire software, I can click onto this node editor version and I can see that there's actually just one piece there. There's not like two pieces that are crossed. It's all connected. There's very few points. It's a nice, clean, ready to cut, ready to, to engrave vector. Let's take a look at the next one. Here I can click on it and right away I can see only part of it highlighted. So I know that there's probably a problem. And if we zoom in on the corner here, and I'll go to my node mode to make it easier to see, you can see that there's one piece and there's another piece and they're not quite touching. So that's one problem. Then the other thing that might happen when you get it, I'll click on this and I'll show you in this version again, you can see uh, it's definitely two pieces. And now what? this is another way that files might come in from people where there are two lines that they created that actually overlap. So um, this one that I just drew for you is probably the trickiest because you can't actually see it. Um, but then these are little signs that you might look for as well to see if you can figure out where the problem is. Now, in my particular software, there are a few ways I can correct this. Um, for example, on this style where they overlap, I have this little scissor tool, which will then, I can snip those little extra points. Um, you'll see. Yep, it corrected it right by itself like that. It was so close together. And you can see that that will just go and automatically fix that for me. Um, another way I do it in my software is, so here I'll show you if I move endpoints, you can see you just move those two together and there's only one dot. 
So there's a couple different ways that you can correct that. You know, your software may be different and you need to figure out the best way to do it. But make sure that those are done. Otherwise, it could really give you some problems when you're cutting. And um, now the other thing that I would do and I would suggest you ask your client to do, as you can see, I created this bounding box here. And um, let me see the size right now. We'll go five by five. We'll make it. So I have this, this box that is five inches by five inches. And so now when I save this file, if I'm the client and I'm sending it to me or, you know, whatever, I would want to export this file as whatever version you want. Usually I use DXS for the software that I use. And I might name it half circles for Tim five by five. So now if I open this up in some software, sometimes it'll come in in like too small or it will be, uh, you know, misshapen or something. So now I know if I just select everything and I make that exterior box five inches by five inches in my software, it's gonna keep all the proportions and all the relationships correct. And I'll have a clean file that's ready to go. So definitely something that I've learned from experience in writing back and forth. When I ask people to send me files, um, I tend to ask them now, I say, draw a box around it. I don't care how big it is, 100 feet, whatever it needs to be, draw a box around it and let me know how big that box is when you save your file. It's gonna make my life a lot easier. And then I go through and I check all the nodes and make sure that they um, have them all connected properly because I don't wanna trust that work and start cutting and make a mistake. Okay, so now let's look at the art that I got sent that I'm going to do this kind of like marquetry inlay thing with. But if you're like me, you need a break from the computer screen right now. So we'll take a quick look at some of these little scraps of vintage veneer I have that I got from my friend Jordan over at Two Avocado Signs. Uh, he mailed me a care package and uh, I save every little scrap of this stuff as you can see because it comes in handy for projects like this. Back to my Vectric software, I have my logo that I sort of played with as well as the overall shape of the headstock that I need to duplicate I already saved in here. And you'll notice that I'm sort of putting everything onto a different layer and a different color, and that'll help me keep track of it later as I import this to my laser cutting software. Now that little horseshoe crab guy is the art that my client provided. And what I'm doing now is I'm making a copy of it and um, blowing it up just a little bit bigger than the original and uh, I tried one technique there I didn't like and so now I want I did it again. The idea is to have a duplicate of the vector that is just slightly oversized and that way it's going to help take care of the kerf of the laser. Yes, uh, everything you cut, of course, when you have a blade, the thickness of the blade removes material that you'll never get back. And the laser, even though it has almost no kerf, is what they call that, uh, that sort of space that the blade cuts away, uh, there is still a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to do is from the main part, I'm going to cut out the original size hole. But then when I cut the inlay part that I want to put in there, I'm going to use that slightly larger, that about one one hundredth of an inch larger file to cut that shape out so it should fit a little bit more snug into the hole. And now that I take all those layers, I save them, I exported them, I'm creating a bounding box just to make sure I have enough material, and I'm going to cut each of these paths as they need to be cut. You can see how keeping the colors separate make it easier for me to sort through these colors now to find the right cutting paths that I need for each thing. And uh, first I want to engrave my logo into this headstock and then cut out the outline, and then I'll have to set up another file to cut the inlay part. I let the film here run at actual speed so you could see how fast and amazing these lasers are. I have a Thunder laser, which costs a little bit more than some of the inexpensive Chinese ones that you can get online, but you get a lot more customer service and I feel like they, they do a better job sort of making it easier to get you up and going on these things. And I tell you what, out of all the tech machines uh, in my workshop, this is the one that is absolutely worth its weight in gold. Um, I use it on almost every project in some aspect, whether it's just cutting a little template or running a test cut or doing things like these really fancy veneers. You can see here that I put it back together with the parts that cut, I cut out, and you can see how they're a little loose because we were talking about that kerf, and it's also very tricky to hang on to that tail piece. Um, I got lucky and I was able to hang on to them uh, in subsequent cuts, but you might have to create a little trap in your laser to catch those little parts. Um, now we'll cut the inlay, and then I have a slightly larger one, and I went in my laser software and messed around with some sizing there as well. I blew it up a little bit more and cut it out of some scraps. Uh, the client and I hadn't decided what color to do yet. The instrument is mostly blues and greens, and so I cut some out of this little green cutoff that I had left over from another project. And then I also cut it out of some pink. 
um, because I thought that bright color might look cool. Since these little parts are so easy to lose and so easy to break and they cut so fast, I have no problem making a few extras. I don't really feel like I'm wasting too much material doing that. The client and I both thought the green looked really cool because it contrasted a lot, but we ended up going with pink, um, partly because it would just be a sort of nice lighter little touch, a little different than all the other colors on the instrument, and partly because you'll see, since I used the laser, I have these burnt edges, and you can kind of see this black outline that formed all around it that I thought was a nice touch, whereas with the green it just sort of blended in and it was just dark on light. Now I just used wood glue and a bazillion clamps to get that veneer to clamp down as evenly and smoothly as possible to the headstock, and I let that sit for a good long while, overnight in this case, uh, before I went in and did the inlay. And for this, I just used CA glue and did it all pretty quickly. I used my Starbond glue, which I use all the time, uh, and the activator to speed it up. So I was able to just very carefully place everything in there and uh, glue it down all very, very quickly. And see how those black lines formed around the edge? I really liked the look of that. Here I'm just cleaning it off with a little bit of alcohol to help me see what it will look like when it's finished. And here you can see it doesn't have any finish on it yet, and I still have a little more sanding to do before I put finish on it, but you can see how it came out. It came out pretty good, and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, here, I'll show you some of these other inlays, too. You can see that these are some more um, pieces of art that, that Danny sent me. Uh, this is like some shark tooth fossils, and um, I forget what this thing was called. And then here on the body, we have this, I think it's called an, an amorite, um, this fossil. It's like really, really beautiful. And so all of these are art files that were sent to me by the client as just simple DXFs and they're just just lines and what you know some of these weren't connected and I fix it whatever but um, this is such a great way to add value to your product because sure I could do all of this by hand but it would take me forever and then it would bring either the cost of the instrument up or the amount of money that I'm making for my work way down and be putting me working at like less than minimum wage you know so this is you know by investing in this machinery and learning how to use it you can really up the value of your product. You know what, running chisels and hand carving stuff is great. If you're doing it for a hobby and you enjoy that, that's awesome. But if you wanna try and make a living at this stuff uh, in this day and age, I think it's time you can't really avoid it anymore, you know? Now, I do also wanna point out that, uh, as many of you know, I make some sponsored content and a lot of the tech that I have in my shop, I got through sponsored content. Um, I didn't pay cash for it, but I did earn it. I worked very hard for it. And in some ways it actually helped me uh, to learn harder. Like I could have gone out and spent money on a machine and then just let it sit there and collect dust. But because of the, the arrangements that I had where I had to create content with this stuff and it had to be good, it really forced me to jump in and learn um, more and harder. So maybe for you, if that's a way you can do it, I mean, that's awesome. Those opportunities are still out there. Or if you need to shell out the money for it, just don't let it collect dust and become a profit loser. Make it a profit winner in your shop because it is. If you put the time in, it 100% is, not to mention the quality of your work. Um, something a little bit different this week. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do enjoy this kind of stuff, you can go visit me at Patreon, blah, blah, blah. You know the thing. All right. Thanks a lot. Be good.